Morning, guys. I couldn't wait to get here this morning and stand before you and stand before you and stand before you. And I've had some of the same experience that Dave has had, uh, meeting with Jesus in some uh, really hard times. Uh, but <laughs> it sounds like a health update, uh, but uh, welcome back, George. George was right up to the you could see the pavement in front of the pearly gates, right? You know, I mean, it was pretty serious. Just a quick update of where I'm at. Four weeks ago today, I had uh, back surgery. It was, it was going to be a microdiscectomy. In other words, a one-inch incision, and they go in and they shave the, the uh, disc that's pressing on the nerve. And then when they got in there, they recognized that I had some fracture lines in my L5 vertebrae. And... Uh, so thankfully, which I always pray for, for people going into surgery, myself included, that those who are, are attending to them will really pay attention. I mean, we all know what it's like at our work. Sometimes we really are focused, and other times we just kind of let it ride. And uh, I was early in the day. My surgery was at 7.30, and the surgeon noticed this and uh, called my wife in the middle of it and said, um, can we go ahead? Which, you know, what's she going to say? No, my opinion, not having known anything about it, is close him up and send him home. No, she said, go ahead. So they ended up doing a fusion, um, and so it ended up being about a five-inch incision and uh, some ad- extensive work. So the recovery's been a little bit uh, longer. But I'm on the uphill side of that and uh, basically pain-free. I call it a, a happy stiffness. You know, my back is knitting itself back together, so uh, I'm very, gr- very grateful for that, very grateful for people to whom God has given common grace by allowing them to understand this particular part of my anatomy and attend to that and give their special skill to that. And, uh, and nurses along the way, people who have helped, and it's, I'm very grateful for that. And, um, and so this will be the winter of uh, some rehab and some re-strengthening, and, and I'm looking forward to that. So, but it's great to be back with you. And uh, we are, if you're new today, we welcome you this morning to Ironworks. And uh, one of the things about Ironworks is that we want you to come anytime or all the time. You know, one thing about men is they often feel like, well, you know, I've got some travel coming up or I, I, I missed last week and I'll, I'll, ne- I'll never catch up, so I'll just drop out. But we don't want that to be the, the message of Ironworks. Every single week stands by itself. And you're always welcome, no matter what your schedule is. Obviously, we'd like to see you all the time, but many of us can't be here all the time. So anytime you can come, you are welcome. And uh, we welcome guys from other churches. This is really meant to be a community opportunity. And uh, so welcome, guys. And we're in the middle, or we're at the end, of, of building a biblical worldview. And the scaffolding we've done, we've used to build that worldview is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are God's moral law, the way the world works. And he summarized that in Ten Commandments and 613 case laws that showed Israel how to apply those commandments. And of course, the New Testament relies upon that. Jesus came to fulfill that. But the law is not legalism, it's grace. It shows you how the world ought to operate, and it stings when we go against them. We, we feel the pain of a moral universe standing against my sovereign opinion, <laughs> and God has his own opinion about that. So we've been using the Ten Commandments to show us how God is building a, bi- a biblical worldview. So look at your notes. Oh, by the way, before I get started, you've got a little booklet here that I've put together for you. Uh, and it's just meant as a, a little devotional opportunity for you and maybe something to pass along to someone else. Um, and if you open to the front page, what are the three things that every boy, every man wants to hear? I love you, I'm proud of you, and good job. And your real father your father in heaven, you may not have heard this from your biological father or your stepfather or maybe from any other man, your real father, God himself, wants to say that to you every day to establish you uh, in his love and his care. I'll just read this one paragraph. The boy inside every man needs to hear these words every day 
Without them, we really can't be the man we were created to be. But no matter how loving and engaged our earthly fathers are or were, they could never say them enough or in every circumstance. Only the true father can meet his son in every context, in every sorrow, in every challenge, and speak these life-giving words. So these are 12 short devos for you. And what I've done is I've taken a verse and I've written it out in sort of a free-form way to apply it as a father would speak to you, his son. And then I've told you a little story about different things. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. Put it uh, in the smallest room of your home. Get that? All right. And meditate. (laughs) Or put it somewhere... (laughs) Maybe more glorious than that, but uh, really, I hope that you will. Uh, it'll be a, an encouragement to you, because uh, in the dark night of the soul, or just in the fog of a rough day, or in the tension of a relationship that's hurting right now, you need to hear the voice of your father, and that's what this is designed to do. So take it yourself, pass it along to someone who might might enjoy it or read it, and uh, that's for you. So let's go back to where we are. We are on the final three commandments, and uh, we're building a biblical worldview. So let's just review what a worldview is. A worldview is how I see the world. It's like a lens through which I see everything that's happening, how it's designed. is Is it just random? Is it evolution, or is it created? Does it have a design to it? A worldview says to me why things happen. There are certain consequences to actions that we take. And we know that physically. We know that there are are physical laws of the universe, that you, you do something and there's a natural result of that. There are natural laws and there are moral consequences to what we do, moral and ethical consequences. But most of all, the a biblical worldview reminds you of your purpose in the middle of the chaos. Because it's a guideline, it's an anchor to what is real. It gives you meaning and fulfillment in life. So commandment number eight, you shall not steal. What part of you shall not steal do you not understand? <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to unpack that a little bit this morning. But we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. And we're going to lay down some track, first of all, at the created design that God has given us. And that is dominion. Humanity's nature and humanity's calling is to have dominion. Now, I know I'm talking to some guys here who have felt this. One of the most destructive things about the American style of retirement is that men want to come to an end point and just quit what they've been doing, but then they don't know what to do with themselves. And for about a year, you can play golf and build a hot rod and travel and, you know, do all the stuff you've been wanting to do all this time because you didn't have time for it. About a year, you can do that. And then you go, hmm, am I just going to wear my John Deere hat and sit at McDonald's, wait for some other curmudgeon to come in? Now, I'm not just talking about age here. I'm talking about what rages inside every one of us. We want to accomplish things. We want to have a challenge. We want to fix something. We want to invent something. We want to go somewhere. We want to discover something. And you know what that is churning inside of you? It's Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It's dominion. It's not dominance. It's a desire in the Old Testament, or the King James Version, to subdue the earth. So here's what it says. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, if you know something about the image of God in humanity, first of all, he created dominion in both men and women. But it's my opinion, by observation, that the that well, there are, there are two aspects of the of of the image of God. One is dominion, and the other is intimacy. 
We need relationship. We're created that way. And that makes us different than all the animals. You know, we, we invent stuff. We make tools. We, we make things happen. We fix things. We solve problems. But we also need deep relationships. But I think by observation, I would say that men, men's scale falls more heavily on the dominion side. We have to work a little harder at the intimacy and relational side, whereas women's image of God falls more heavily on the intimacy side. Would you agree? What are they always wanting? More of, yeah, I know. You know. <laughs> Where are you? What are you thinking? Can we get closer? You know, Women want, I think, more, are, and again, they, they want dominion as well, but their, their scale is more heavily weighted toward intimacy. But I want to talk today about dominion because God has absolute dominion, but humanity shares this assignment under him. And here's what happened in the third chapter of Genesis is that sin entered and it perverted our cravings for dominion. And history is a long tale of horror as humanity has sought power and dominion for himself, for his tribe, and for his nation. So God came in salvation history and said, I'm going to choose a people. I'm going to select, I'm going to elect Israel, and I'm going to give them my law and I'm going to start building a bulwark against the domination of perverted dominion. And I'm going to give them my law to teach them how to live, how to have a civil society, how to love their families, how to guard their sexuality, how to make something out of this sinful world. And that he calls his law. And that's redemption. Redemption includes our physical, social, and political lives. And that's what God is doing in the Ten Commandments and the law that he gave. So here's what the ultimate goal is in Romans chapter 8. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And we're in that fight. That's our fight. We are going against the grain of the power of sin in the world. And a biblical worldview is the primary tool that helps us stay focused and oriented in that battle. So every arena of life is ordered around God's moral law. So let's look back at commandment number eight because it establishes the way the creation mandate of having dominion is lived out. So, Let's get real practical. Dominion involves property. Private property is protected by the law of God. It's assumed by the law of God. And it's the very basis for a functioning, thriving society. Now, Dennis uh, Prager, I don't know if you know him as a radio host, but he, he has written some commentaries on the Old Testament And he makes, I think, the brilliant conclusion. He said that do not steal summarizes the second tablet of the law. Murder is stealing a life. Adultery is stealing a spouse. Giving false testimony is stealing justice. And coveting is the desire to steal what someone else has. So he really puts this in a central place. When I was a senior in college, I was... uh, head over heels in love with Joanne. And I was crazy and didn't know what I was doing. And uh, I had a 64 Honda 250 Scrambler that I was riding at the time. It was my only means of transportation. And I had an injury, and I had parked it on the campus of our college. And... uh, I hadn't locked the fork. I just parked it there, and we lived at the the school was on top of a huge hill. And uh, one night, uh, somebody stole my motorcycle, and uh, I have not been the same ever since. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember the desperation of that. That was. I I remember uh, stationing myself at an intersection. in in my car and turning off the car and listening at night to see if I could hear somebody riding it, you know. They they basically rolled it off, rolled it down the hill and hot-wired it, and I never never saw it again. 
and it was my only possession. In fact, I was planning to sell it to buy this gigantic diamond ring for my wife, for my future wife, you know, like $250 worth of diamond. And uh, so I was crushed when this was stolen from me, and I was so outraged. If you've ever had anything stolen from you that you thought was yours, you have the title to it, it belongs to you, you made it, you protected it, and somebody came along and stole it. Now, your, your anger may not be a righteous anger, but your anger is basically a part of the hardwiring of God in humanity. That private property, things that we own, things that we ought to be able to control, don't belong to just whoever comes along to take it. Whether it's armed robbery or, or internet fraud, it's stealing. And uh, so let's look at some of the ways that, that the Bible talks about this, some of the practical ways, and you're probably thinking of some ways right now. Uh, and you'll get a chance to talk about that around your tables and pound the table and go back and relive that and go out of here angry today about what was stolen from you. <laughs> well, let's look at some scripture. You're not to steal human beings. Kidnapping, for the sake of putting people into slavery, is against God's law. The abolitionists of the 1800s campaigned on that, that this is against God's law. Obviously, stealing property is against God's law, and that includes things like cheating on your income tax, <clears throat> fare hopping, you know, you can't just ride the light rail and jump over the turnstile. That's stealing. Uh, stealing is issuing a bad product that you know is not going to perform the way you promised. Uh, can we say this? Inflation steals from us. It's, it's, you know, we don't know who exactly to blame for that, but it takes away uh, our, our purchasing power. Redistribution is a multisyllabic word that basically means taking, stealing what you have and giving it to somebody else. So how can I steal from you? Let me count the ways. <laughs> There's lots of ways. But at the core of this, let's go back to the positive. Private property is essential for any free and just society. Because just think how this is woven into God's moral law. Private property incentivizes care and cultivation and stewardship. You know, if if I own something, whether it's, a, whether it's a power saw or a boat, if I own it, I tend to care for it. I'm incentivized not only to, to care for its usefulness, but I'm incentivized to care for its value. And, and you can't measure that. You, you, you can't care for somebody else's property quite the way you care for your own. It maximizes creativity. You know, if... <laughs> If you have an 800-square-foot house and you have six boys, you're going to have to be creative, right, Steve? <laughs> you're going to have to build some bunk beds or make some of them sleep in the garage. I don't know, but you're going to be, you're going to be creative. It maximizes creativity, innovation, and planning. Because if it belongs to you and you know its capacity, you know what it's capable of doing, you will, you will plan around that. You will steward that. Private property instills gratitude. For what you have. You know, I'm so thankful for my recliner <laughs> that I've been sleeping in for four weeks. You know, I'm just thankful for so many things. And, and if I own it, I'm, I ought to be grateful for it. And then, it, and then private property or, or my owning something sparks innovation and improvement and expansion. And the means, the means of wealth is guess what? Work. It's work. It's investment. It might not be your physical labor. It's the work of your capital. Or it's the work of your skill. Or it's the work of your knowledge. That you invest that. And God says, as you work hard, God will prosper you. Maybe not like some multi-billionaire, but he will prosper you. I remember when my dad, my dad was widowed twice and 
after the second time he went to live with his sister and his sister had a grandson who came uh, over every once in a while. He was about 10 years old. And my dad taught him how to, stack fi- how to split and stack firewood. And he used to say to him, Derek, I'm going to teach you how to work so that you don't have to steal. Those are two opposite polarities. In fact, in Ephesians 4, it says, let the thief no longer steal, but... Let him work with his hands so that he has something to give. It's a complete 360. You know, instead of stealing somebody else's property, you work to gain your own property and you do it with an eye to generosity for someone else. So here's, a, here's an interesting thing I came across in, in Exodus chapter 22. This has to do with borrowing stuff, which I do a lot actually. Listen to this. This is interesting. It says, um, If a man borrows anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, like an ox, you know, a, a tractor in those days, the owner not being with it, he shall make full restitution. So if you borrowed it and you broke it, you need to replace it. But if the owner was with it, He shall not make restitution. If it was hired or rented, it came for its hiring fee. Isn't that interesting? So so if the owner was if the owner was using the chainsaw and it broke, you're off. You're off scot free. (laughs) But if you borrowed it and broke it, you should replace it. And it's an interesting, just practical thing about teaching the Israelites about what it means to honor someone else's private property. Here's the, here's the key, and we see this in our world all around. All tyrannies take away private property. They all want your stuff. Not just because they're greedy for your stuff, but because behind your ownership is power. It's independence. It's an ability to make your own decisions. So Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels... And in the Communist Manifesto, called for the abolition of all private property, the abolition of inheritance, the centrality of all credit in one state bank, the centrality of all communications. They called for state ownership of factories, farms, and the abolition of family. Now, if you listen carefully, you can hear that in the echoes of our own culture today, to some extent. Victor Davis Hanson, who's an astute observer, says, quote, socialism had manifestly failed everywhere it had been tried by 1980. But it's making a revival today, and we we won't get into that totally, but um, it's making a revival because people want some assurances about education, about free college, they want... uh, uh, universal health care, they want to make sure the environment is taken care of, and there's a sort of a, a fantasy view of what socialism looks like, and they're not looking deep enough to say, in order to have those things, we need to take what you have in your private property and give it to somebody else. Now, I'm not trying to start a revolution here. I'm just trying to tell you that when you have faulty research, which Marx had, And when you have an unbiblical premise, and that is that everybody should have their fair share, whether they work or not, then you have an unbiblical worldview, and what you will get is communism and disastrous forms of socialism. Listen to, uh, I'll quote from an article of Victor Victor Davis Hanson. He said, the tragedy was that those who promised utopia generally delivered hell. According to the estimates of the Black Book of Communism, the grand total of victims of communism was between 85 and 100 million. Under Stalin, the the lowest estimate under Stalin's reign, including under in World War II, was 20 million people Murdered. murdered, starved to death, sent to the gulags. In the Great Leap Forward under Mao's reign, 
in the 1960s, uh, or the 40s, excuse me, late 40s and early 50s, the Great Leap Forward, 45 million people died. And most of these were starved to death because they collectivized the farms, they demanded certain quotas from the farms, and by the time the government got its quota, there wasn't enough for the people to eat. And this is what happened in the Ukraine. If you want to know why the Ukraine is such a mess today, it's because about 10 million people were starved to death in the 30s in the Ukraine. We knew about it, and we hid that fact. Uh, there were 2.75 million people sent to the gulags in Russia. Here's what he says. The various socialist regimes could not even justify their murderous behavior by providing those they spared with higher living standards than their counterparts living under capitalism. On the contrary, they were economically disastrous. The collectivization of agriculture invariably reduced farm productivity. A substantial proportion of the victims of communism lost their lives because of the famines that resulted from the collectivization in the Soviet Union and China. Now, we could rant on about that. Uh, we can't go back and fix that. But if anything stands as a stark reminder of the, the beautiful centrality of individual dominion over a few things that you own. And then when you own them and you steward them and you do them under God's providence, then you begin to give out of that. You begin to improve your lot. And um, so that's, that's the whole point of stealing property. Well, there's a couple of other things, and uh, we'll just handle them quickly. There's also stealing a reputation through slander and gossip and libel, what the Old Testament calls tail-bearing, you know, un unsubstantiated rumor. just read yesterday that Sarah Palin, who's been off the front pages for a long time, uh, they're having a jury selection in her, her lawsuit against the New York Times from about five years ago or whatever it was, maybe longer ago than that, but... Um, the New York Times published a story about her when she targeted certain districts in an election and they claimed that that was the incentive for a nutcase to shoot Gabby Giffords. And uh, she is suing them because they're stealing her reputation. Now, whether that comes out or not, I, I don't know. That's not the point. But if you've ever had your reputation sullied, if you've ever had a lie told about you, that's not only a violation of the Ninth Commandment, it's a violation of the Eighth Commandment because it's stealing what you have as a good name. They're stealing knowledge. Do you notice every time we sing a worship song, there's a, there's a note on the screen at the end of whom we borrowed it from? Do you notice we don't show many videos anymore? Because YouTube, we used to steal a bunch of them, you know. Well, we weren't stealing then. They didn't have the law then. But, you know, we, we don't show many videos anymore because you, uh, YouTube says, hey, wait a minute, that's a licensed uh, video. And unless you pay us or the originator of that, you can't just take that and use it. You can't quote me without giving me money. No. <laughs> Copyrights. You protect uh, intellectual property. Here's what it says in, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 13. You shall not have in your bag two kinds of weights, a large and a small. In other words, weights for a scale. You shall not have in your house two kinds of measures, a large and a small. A full and a fair weight you shall have, and a full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. For all you who do such things, all who dishon are dishonest, are an abomination to the Lord your God. How many ounces is in a pound of coffee? <laughs> it's not 16 anymore. I think it's like about 14. But it's still called a pound of coffee. I object. Anyway. <laughs> But the whole point of just weights and measures. And, and isn't it great that we do have a bureau of weights and measures that checks the scales at the meat market, keeps the butcher's thumb off the scale, you know? It, it's all about justice. It's all about not stealing. 
There were, there were laws in the Old Testament against usury, which is a crushing rate of, of interest, especially to a brother or a sister who belongs to you. Then there's stealing. I thought this was interesting. A stealing through bystanding or moral or immoral apathy. So if a neighbor's ox is stuck in a ditch, you can't just walk by and say, well, too bad. It's, it's the stealing through neglect and carelessness. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 22. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. And if he does not live near you and you do not know who he is, you shall bring it home to your house and it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. And you shall do the same with his donkey or his garment or with any lost thing of your brother's which he loses and you find. You may not ignore it. You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help him to lift them up again. So is finders keepers a biblical rule? rule? No. We have a responsibility not only to not be bystanders when a direct crime is being committed, but we are, we are to not be bystanders in the, in the, the degradation of property. Uh, we're to restore it to whomever owns it. So, so you see in this, in this commandment and all the case law, and I've only read you just a few, is, is justification, our right standing with God, is by faith alone, by grace, through grace, by faith alone. But our sanctification, we are taught through the law what that looks like. So think about the story of Jesus and the Good Samaritan. Obviously, we think about a, a story of how to love your neighbor. Jesus was asked the question, what does that mean? Well, Jesus basically said, these people who passed him by were guilty of the immoral apathy of bystanding. And it was the Samaritan who was obeying the law of God and giving him care. So there's a lot here, and... Um, you know, if we have stolen anything, we're obviously under conviction, and we ought to return it. But we also recognize that we're living in a world where there are many devious, sundry ways of theft. And that doesn't make us the moral police, but it makes us aware of how God has wanted us to care for what we have. Next week, we're going to talk about a question, is capitalism Christian? That ought to light us up. I'll find a guest speaker and come on back next week. <laughs> I've got some questions for you that you can talk about around your tables, and uh, let's, uh, let's enjoy our fellowship together.